Thank you very much, Daniel Neuilly. A testimony to the challenges. Uh, you highlighted what, uh, what is ahead of us, you highlighted what has been achieved, and uh, we would like to discuss that now under the kind moderation of Professor Pfingsten, together with uh, DG of EBA, Adam Farkas. So please welcome with you Wolf Klins from MEP, Member of Parliament Europe, and last but not least, Stefan Bielmeier, the Chief Economist of the DZ Bank. Thank you indeed, Commissioner Barnier and Madame Nui, for your inspiring talks. You uh, were both hinting at two different pillars of the European Banking Union. Uh, Madame Nui um, reminded us of the achievements, but also wasn't silent about the challenges ahead in the area of banking supervision. And Commissioner Barnier touched, uh, among others, the resolution mechanism. Um, and um, if I um, interpret him correctly, he was pointing out this, this was part of the biggest project of the European Union uh, since the introduction of the Euro. Uh, we'll try to address this whole uh, area in this panel here, and uh, we, that is Stefan Bielmeier, he's Chief Economist of DZ Bank, Adam Farkas, Executive Director of the European Banking Authority, and Dr. Wolf Klins, Member of the European Parliament. Um, and to start with, I would uh, like to focus uh, on the European resolution mechanism. According to a memo by the European Commission from mid-April, there is 32 hours uh, to agree on a resolution scheme. Um, and the institutions involved are the Single Resolution Board, the Commission and the Council. And so my first question to all of the panelists as a yes-no question, and then afterwards we'll have time to discuss this, is the following. Will the decision process be fast enough to meet this deadline? Stefan Biermeier. Yes, I think so. Okay. Adam Fakert? I would say yes, but with some concerns. Okay. Uh, so mild yes, I yes. would say. By necessity, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> Uh, let me ask you to explain your views. Uh, they were all on the yes side, but with some reservations on, on part of uh, two of the panelists, at least. I'd like to start with uh, Stefan Bielmeier. Uh, what's your yes? And, and by the way, we, we are uh, asked to uh, be kind of strict on time, so this is yellow and red cards uh, signing if the answers go uh, too long, and these are the genuine ones being used in the, the Premier German Soccer League, or as our <laughs> friends from the uh, non-continental Europe would say, the first, uh, the Premier Football League, of course. Stefan Bielmann. Well, the, <coughs> the SSM, I think, it should have enough time to react on a crisis in the euro area. Uh, so, um, we have many mechanisms already in, yeah, introduced, installed, and um, we might have some problems with um, yeah, systemic crisis, but if we come to a more contained crisis, I think then definitely uh, the SSM should be react, yeah, functional and should have also react in a timely manner. As soon as we come to a systemic crisis, then definitely a bit more hesitant with this yes, but given the fact that uh, the institutional framework currently is uh, set in that way, does the um, systemic crisis is not, um, um, not really realistic, I think one can say yes, that this uh, mechanism is really functionable. I think, I think when, we, when we talk about resolving a bank, is, is probably one of the one of the most difficult tasks um, authorities can have, especially if, if a bank is large, if it's very highly interconnected, especially if a bank is, is cross-border and has got um, activities um, across uh, many jurisdictions, even, even if it's only within the, within the European Union. When the, when the resolution um, decision needs to be made, uh, an action needs to be taken, it is, of course, it has to be a well-informed decision, and it is a very legally difficult and, and often challenged decision in, 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 the, in, in, 
in uh, various jurisdictions, if we look at um, examples, um, a lot of legal challenges are brought against uh, resolution decision in the, in the history of, of, of resolving banks. So I think we should not underestimate, and that was my hesitation uh, when, I, when I said yes, with, with, uh, with, with a lot of risks attached, uh, that, that this, is, this is probably the most complex decision authorities can, uh, can come to. And I think what, what the, the new mechanism is, is, is suggesting, the, the new design is suggesting, is a very carefully designed decision process, uh, but it's a very complex decision process, and that's, that's the risk um, in, 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 in actually implementing it. We should, we, should, we should look at examples of resolution of large banks. They, they have always been very, very difficult if, 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 if they ever happened. Uh, so that was my, that was my shade of... Um, of, of caution with, uh, with, with, uh, with the yes. Well, <clears throat> what has been decided is a typical European compromise, and it's certainly not the ideal situation or, or, or solution. We from the European Parliament had different ideas, but we could not convince the Council to really follow our uh, ideas this time. I think it's the first start, and uh, I do hope that it will work, despite the fact that it is a rather complicated setup. What I'm afraid of is that the final decision, since the, the uh, council is getting involved, might be politicized. And we all know from history that member states do find it very, very difficult to resolve a bank. Uh, I just think of the West Deutsche Landesbank. Uh, hadn't it been for the uh, competition commissioner, Almunia, uh, probably the West LB would still be in existence and would not be resolved. So I think that the necessity will, will, make that, uh, will make that, in fact, a decision will be taken. Whether it is an ideal decision and the right one, future will tell. Okay. Uh, in the, the problems you mentioned in the process, is, does that have something to do with national interests versus European interests? Yes, I'm, I'm quite sure. I mean, whenever a bank is being, has to be resolved, it is a bank that, you know, is a bank of a member state. And so whether politicians like it or not, they will automatically also think about what reaction that might have in that particular country. What is the way of building a more European attitude then in this process? Like Madame Nui stressed the importance of that. Uh. Well, I think we are on a good way in this uh, respect, uh, forming now the, uni the European bodies, the SSM, SRM, um, to, um, yeah, get a greater um, European idea, but nevertheless, banks are nationalized institutes, are national institutes, and for that reason, I think it will be very difficult over the next few years to, um, to uh, have a more European approach here. For that reason, I think the European bodies are very important for these larger banks, for the more significant banks, um, to find here more European approach. Nevertheless, I think even, uh, uh, Given these um, new developments, the national yeah, impact will still be relatively large. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Adam Farkas mentioned that um, these decisions are very complex, in, in particular in, in global, when you're talking about global banks acting in many different countries, in possibly different business models in different countries. Um, could you comment on the, the conflict between speed and quality of this decision? I think, um, uh, yes, I, I think there, there could be. I mean, in, in, in every decision, when you try to trade off speed and, and, and quality, you might find a, a difficult choice to, uh, to be made. But I think my comment uh, to this, and this is a major step forward in the, in the European legislation, is, um, is, is the way to dissolve this conflict or to, to potentially reduce the, the risk of this conflict is in good planning. And I think the, the new legislation uh, has got extensive um, stipulations, extensive um, description of what needs to be done to reduce this, uh, this sort of conflict before uh, a resolution situation or, or the risk of, of, of resolution arises 
and that is in the um, recovery and resolution planning of, of, of institutions. Once these plans are real, are, are, are good quality, they are really agreed by the respective authorities who are involved in the process, that in itself can reduce significantly the, uh, the issue of quality versus uh, speed problem because the, the, the decision will be well prepared and well informed and therefore if a decision is taken quickly, the quality will not be compromised. So that would be one, one factor I would, um, I would list. The other factor I think which needs to be, uh, needs to be mentioned is the, is, the, uh, is the developments uh, Europe has, has made in terms of cutting the feedback loop between the sovereign fiscal um, purse and the individual situation of banks. With the, uh, European, with the European supervision, with the um, mechanism that is set up to support resolution, not from the taxpayers' money, with the, with the new concept of... Uh, of, of a shift in burden sharing uh, towards uh, private investors. This is all pointing to a direction that banks' resolvability is going to be enhanced and therefore these, these potential conflicts in the decisions will be, will be reduced. So I think the, 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 the whole architecture is moving to the right direction. Nevertheless, the decision will still be very difficult. Will this decision process convince capital markets? I mean, the, the, t the time pressure on the institutions comes from capital markets because they react so quickly and it's, of course, uh, no coincidence that often this resolution occurs over the weekend. Uh, well, I, I think compared to what we've had so far in the past, this is a major step forward. And therefore, I think the capital markets will certainly applaud this development, knowing that the uh, situation is not yet ideal. But what is ideal? I mean, it will take some more time. Uh, that's obvious. But I think I agree with uh, Adam Farkas that the decision will have to be taken rather quickly, in a few hours or over Saturday or weekend at, at, at most. But on the other hand, uh, the, the situation will, will have been prepared properly. I mean, all of those banks will have, you know, uh, prepared in detail uh, the necessary steps that will have to be taken in case the bank really runs into serious difficulties. So therefore, the, the, the decision makers do not have to start from scratch. That would, of course, be impossible. And, and if that is true, and if everybody does his homework properly, then I think uh, the, the, uh, the decision will, will be possible over a weekend, and I think the capital markets will, will uh, salute the, this approach. Comment from the direct capital yes. market participant? Yes, sure, the capital market uh, has improved significantly. The spreads for banks declined very strongly, hand in hand, also with the improvement um, which is visible in the spreads for the country. So there is still a strong linkage between country spreads and bank spreads. But nevertheless, I think the capital market improved also because of um, the new mechanism which has been set in place now. Um, but uh, to be honest, I think nobody believes that a bank can, can be resolved over the weekend, but everybody believes that there might be a kind of bridge financing, a new body in which the bank can be then uh, be brought and then a uh, solution can be found. Um, so here I think definitely this is a very strong improvement for the capital market, for the stability of the market, and also this is clearly visible in the refinancing costs of the banks. Okay. So it's good to hear that from different perspectives we um, basically are told to be optimistic concerning uh, the working of this mechanism, although there are, uh, of course, uh, some reservations. Uh, I'd like to ask each one of you for what's the most important obstacle you see in this mechanism? Which one? The uh, for resolution. the working of the uh, resolution mechanism. Which is the most important obstacle? <coughs> What could endanger this? Well, I, I mean, obviously, it will take some time until the resolution fund is, will be properly financed, you know, and uh, eight years. Uh, so uh, what happens if after two years, you know, there is need for, for the uh, use of those funds? Uh, that's one. And also, there is some hesitation, as we know, of the member states to really accept that the funds will be mutualized. You know, we do have, we have agreed now that 40% will be mutualized first year, 22nd year, and then linearly till the end. But um, again, here, here the, the opinion and the request of the Parliament and of the Council differed. And the fact that the Council insists on, on, on the funds to be in, in, the, in the national 
decision-making power for, for the time being uh, indicates that, you know, the, 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 it, it will not be that easy to accept a fully mutilation, even though it's not the taxpayer's money anymore. It, it's the financial sector's money, you know. Or you could say, finally, it's the shareholder's money of the financial institutions or, or the customers, whatever. But that will be important, that we really achieve here the mutualization as basically, uh, uh, you know, agreed upon in, in principle. I think the possibly the biggest obstacle or single, if, if I have to say one, one thing, is to establish the credibility in, in the eyes of the markets that it's working, that it's, it's functioning and it's working as designed. Um, and I would use the single supervisory mechanism as a contrast. I think the single supervisory mechanism will, will build its credibility very, very fast. It, it, is, um, it is expected to, uh, to be in place. I'm, uh, we are very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that it will, it will prove its credibility very soon. The resolution mechanism is, of course, is, is more difficult because you have less number of cases, hopefully, um, and it, it's more complex. But I think the single most important obstacle is to, to achieve credibility because from that point on, when, when markets, capital markets believe in it, then they, they will be able to price in um, the, 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 the new architecture and the way it works. Yeah, well, the largest obstacle is, on the one hand, clearly the funding, it's clear. And the other point is probably really the, the confidence whether this um, mechanism can really work also or can handle larger bank in the connected bank, uh, even in a very difficult financial market situation. Okay. Um, fortunately, you mentioned the term credibility because that leads me to another um, pressing yes or no question. Um, uh, according f uh, for the single resolution funds, according to the numbers I have, the banks contribute from two th 2016 and by uh, 2024, 55 billion euros should be collected there. Uh, will, this, um, will the single resolution funds be capitalized adequately for its purpose? No. I've, I think not for larger banks in Europe. For the smaller banks, yes, but not for the larger banks. I think I, I would say yes to this. If the Commission's calculations are right, and Michel Barnier pointed to them, uh, I would say yes. Okay, so we do have a split opinion here. So I think uh, we'll let uh, Stefan Bielmeier start first, explain <laughs> his no. Well, the no is actually pretty simple because if you want to resolve a very large uh, international connected bank, which are very large trading and credit book, um, it could easily be the case that the, the resources of this fund will come to an end very soon and very fast. Because we have seen in, in the last crisis that uh, to resolve such a large bank is very, very costly. And given the current um, uh, regulation schemes, I think that the larger banks will even become more larger in the, in the future. So the, the connectivity will rise over the time for the larger banks in Europe. And so this in my view, will bring this fund very fast to its limits. Uh, well, very, uh, very briefly, I think there is, um, there is um, some misunderstanding between the, the firepower of a resolution fund um, versus the firepower of bailout uh, funds. <coughs> uh, the resolution fund is not there to bail out right. every, ev <coughs> everybody under any, any, any circumstances. Or, or, or cover the losses, all, all of the losses suffered by, by a financial institution or financial institutions. So I think if we put this bailout fund into, into the structure of the, of, the, of the new mechanism, and we look at very carefully how losses are absorbed by higher capital and then by the, uh, by the uh, loss absorbency capacity requirements, uh, then potentially uh, even with the, the bailing of other creditors, then if we, if we add the powers of the resolution fund to this to, uh, to sustain 
the, operational, the, the operations of a bank that is otherwise viable but suffered, uh, suffered losses, then I think the, the amount, this amount uh, is, is, is much bigger than we think. We should not think this fund as, as, a, as, a, as a pure bailout fund, which will just pour money into, into a bank and, and absorb the losses. Well, so that's I, why I think it's um, I it's can more only than uh, underline what Adam Farkas just said. I mean, the, the single resolution mechanism or fund uh, has to be viewed uh, together with the bail-in procedure that has been decided now. And as has been pointed out before, 8% of, of, uh, of the total assets, uh, of the total liabilities, uh, is, is, you know, a, a lot of money, after all. And, and if all shareholders and all creditors really are being uh, called upon uh, first, uh, and only from that point on, from 8% on, the fund has to be, has to come to to the to the help. I think it's it, it it might well prove to be to be okay. The commission simulated the last crisis on that assumption that we did have a bail-in mechanism, and that we had did have a fund of 55 billion. And the result was it would have been sufficient. Is that the um, basis for uh, Commissioner Barnier's statement saying uh, that this fund would have only been used once in the previous? Well, that I, I do not know whether it would have used, been used only, only, only once. I mean, let's be realistic. Uh, crises uh, develop very often in ways that are very difficult to forecast uh, before. And so it may well have been that, you know, to use it once would not have been, would not have been the right answer. I do not know. But what, what we can say is, that uh, rather than saying it has to be hundreds of, of billions, uh, we, we, the Commission based it on a, on a reasonable, pragmatic approach, simulating uh, what has now been decided and using the past crisis as a real case example. And the outcome was satisfactory. So I would say it's not so much this, the, the size of it, it's, it's more will it be available fast enough because can we wait eight years until we have the 55? If we decided to have 120 and we would have uh, 10, need 10 years to get to the 120, it would, wouldn't be of any use, you see? I think that is important. How, what do we do in case we do not have the 55 available because the next crisis or the next uh, sort of bank that runs into serious difficulties happens in, in, in three or four years' time? That's where Madame Nui comes in once more time <laughs> to, to prevent this scenario. Right. Um, I think in the, in, in the general public, at least, there seems to be this misunderstanding in particular stress. Like if you look at some papers, you find that the approved state, measure, state aid measures from October 2008 till December 2012 are in the order of magnitude of 600 billion euro and not including the guarantees. So is this kind of um, misunderstanding something that drives the discussion or what could we do against it if it does? I think it, it is a very recent example, and, and I think the, the, the primary response to this crisis was, uh, was a lot of the, lot of the burden of, of helping the banking system out of this crisis was put on the, on, on the, on, on the fiscal balances. So what we can see is that, that there was a, there was a mas massive shift of burden uh, to, the, uh, to the respective national debts. But I think the new architecture is exactly trying to shift this, this, uh, this paradigm to, uh, to a new one where the burden sharing is, 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 is shifted from, from, the, uh, from the shoulders of the, of the taxpayers much more towards um, market participants or, or, or generally uh, claimants of, or private, private agents um, who have claims against the bank. And I think we should, we, given this, this recent experience and the heavy burden put on, the, uh, on, on taxpayers, probably the public perception has not moved yet um, towards the new paradigm. And I think that's why the credibility of the new architecture needs to be established so that people start believing in it and also capital markets start to believe in it that yes, this is the way it is going to be, it is going to be done in, in the future should a crisis emerge. And I, uh, I completely agree with, um, with, uh, with Dr. Kinnens that, that, that we cannot 
we can, we can never predict how the next crisis will come, what the size, the complexity of it, will it be just an idiosyncratic crisis of one or two large players, or it will, it will drag um, or, or, or lead to some sort of a more systemic events. Uh, it is very difficult, but what we need to establish is the credibility of the, of the new system, of the new paradigm. And unfortunately, that uh, differentiates economic science from uh, sciences like uh, physics, where you can do experiments on and on. So if, if we fail on the first experiments, there may be no time for another then. Uh. And even they realize that they followed the wrong path for many years. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to the, to the financing of the Bank Rescue Fund. Um, Again, a yes-no question for the three of you. Um, should small regional banks be exempted from contributing to the Bank Rescue Fund? Uh, from, from my side, I'm clear, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask for a pass? You, you ask for a pass, okay. Yes, should be exempted. Okay. Uh, w why should they? <laughs> well... Um, the small banks, especially in Germany, they have their, their own rescue mechanism. Uh, they have a very, um, they have a business model which is really concentrated uh, to the real economy. Uh, they have a clear um, yeah, a diversification within the system, and so they should really treat it in a different way than the large institutes which have a very strong international uh, interaction which which have a completely different risk profile. But I think the most important issue is here definitely that they we have already established a working rescue mechanism in the sectors which is uh, more or less um, valid for the smaller banks, and for that reason, I think they should be accepted. Well, I would say when I think of a typical co-op uh, of savings bank in Germany, they do have, uh, as I've just been said, their own institu so-called institutional uh, security or, or, or safety uh, system. And the, the probability that they will ever use the, the single resolution fund is zero. So therefore, why should I pay into a system that I will never have? never use. Uh, that is, in my opinion, not, not quite logical. I do accept that maybe for political reasons uh, one has to agree that they are part of the system, also as financial contributor, but then, of course, it has to be really on the basis of proportionality and risk. And uh, then the outcome will be that they have to pay, but, you know, relatively small amounts, and of course, at the same time, they should no longer be part of the, of the uh, bank levy that exists in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Germany in that particular case, or in that member state, for that matter. Okay. So, but where does uh, your uh, confidence come from that their probability to fail within this insurance system is, is really zero? I mean, we haven't seen any... any I'm not th saying that there is no probability that they fail. Uh, we've seen many cases where they have failed, of course. What I'm saying is that if they do fail, they have their own approach, their own system, how they, get, how they solve the situation. They either merge or they do this or that. So in other words, what I'm saying is they, they will use the, the existing system and they will not use the new system that is being implemented right now. I think that's the point. We have a proven system here. It has worked in the past, and why, why should we use, should not, shouldn't, shouldn't be used it in the future? So uh, this amounts to saying if a group of banks sets up a um, deposit insurance system, and if this group of banks is sufficiently diversified, for example, they should be exempted from, from participating in the overall deposit insurance system. Well, if you set up a new system, maybe then you can also join the, the now established system. But if you have already approved working system, then it really is the question whether you should join the new system. Okay. So now let yeah. me ask Adam Farkas <laughs> for his pass. I, 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 well, I think it's 
the, the reason I the reason I, I I asked for the pass is of course because it's a it's a highly politicized um, uh, politicized question these days, and we we try to stay out of uh, of political decisions. But of course, the the, the points I would I would make um, here is that. It, it, what, what is very important is, is that we, we, we create some sort of a level playing field uh, among, the, among the participants. So we don't, first of all, we don't provide competitive advantage to any of the subsectors of the, of the European banking system. We are building something for the entire European uh, economy. And as we, as we heard in the, in, in the speeches, it, it is a very diverse system. There are, there are many types of institutions, there are many different types of structures, very different sizes of institutions, very different business models of institutions. It's a very um, diverse um, um, system um, of more than 8,000 institutions. Um, I think what is important is that we don't provide, by regulation, we don't provide competitive advantage to one or the other, or, or, or disadvantage to one or the other. That's one, that's one thing, but that's, not, uh, that's more of a, co a, a competition uh, point. In terms of the safety net, what, what, uh, I think one point which needs to be considered is that whether with such an exemption we can still maintain uh, the uh, the credibility of the of the resolution mechanism so that the taxpayer is exempted from the uh, from the potential uh, potential burden in case a resolution becomes necessary I generally don't believe that we can we can ever ascertain that that there is zero probability of failure of any uh, any market-based institution uh, so what we need to calibrate is what what sort of risk um, there is and what is the uh, what is the toolkit which can address this risk without with, with maintaining the same principle that we shift the burden from the from the taxpayers to uh, to the uh, to the private agents or 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 to the uh, to the system. But so I think I think that's the that that's the real issue here. And this debate is about one particular system which is already in existence and it has managed to resolve uh, certain institutions. Um, but, 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 but the question should be whether th that, that, that success is, is in any way based on the perception of, of, uh, of fiscal backing uh, behind the system I think or it's not. A, this, this is a highly theoretical point, whether we like it or not, it's been decided. They yes. will have to contribute, so, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's been decided. Uh, we, we lost <laughs> in the parliament. <laughs> But that's why I was trying to be theoretical uh, <laughs> in, in my answer and not, yeah. not political, because right. it was a political decision which, uh, which has been taken. So. You, you mentioned uh, the differences across um, the business models in of banks, uh, and I would like to ask Stefan Bielmeier uh, to comment on the role of the differences in business models in this whole arena of single supervisory mechanism and so on. I'll do. I think this is a really important issue because um, you have some yeah, banks or a group of banks which are really concentrated on the real economy and they have just a few yeah, links to the capital markets. They are, in my view, less. The risk profile is uh, here uh, smaller, definitely, than for the banks which are really uh, heavily involved in capital markets business and um, all these areas. And here we need definitely, in my view, a differentiation because um, the, the margins in these uh, business models, which are more concentrated on the real, econ real world or real economy, are smaller than in the capital markets area. Um, but the, the cost for regulations are more or less the same. So in here, one has to be careful uh, not to... Um, to damage a well-working business model in the whole process. Um, how do you see, Adam Farkas, the these conflicts about between national business models and the European supervision? Is the combination of the two vice or virtue? I think um, I think I wouldn't call. Business models very very national, although there are uh, there are um, some specific uh, structures and, and models that developed in in, in, in various jurisdictions. I, I would I, what I would like to say first is that I don't think we can we can we can clearly say and support with evidence that um, any particular business model was 
less or more risky in this European crisis. We did see very pure local mortgage lending institutions or SME lending institutions failing spectacularly, as well as we did see um, large investment banking activities creating, uh, creating huge losses. So I think this, this crisis was not a homogeneous uh, crisis in, in, in Europe, and, and there are still institutions having, having, having problems to meet their, uh, their capital requirements. So I would not I would, not, I, would, I would try to play down uh, the, uh, the, the, this, this argument that one or another business model is, is, is completely immune from, uh, from, uh, from risk. And I think what, 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 what uh, and I, I would clearly say that, that I don't think there is a contradiction between the variety of business models and, and common supervision. The common supervision, one of the big challenges to build up common supervision or, or a single supervisory mechanism is to incorporate the analysis of business models into the risk assessment of individual institutions so that the risk assessment is, is, um, is really corresponding to the business model and the measures that are, uh, the supervisory measures that are designed for a specific institution is reflecting the, 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 the business model of that institution. It's not easy, but that's, I don't see a contradiction. It, it is making it um, um, a, a very difficult, but intellectually very interesting, interesting task. But in particular, if we share um, your assessment that in the recent crisis, there were no superior business models because business models from all areas failed, as you said. Uh, then this makes the supervision particularly difficult because it's not just checking the, the business model as such, but you also have to kind of mirror it with the, the uh, risk management and procedures in place. I think what it, what it tells me is that it's, it's the business model in itself is not an explanatory variable um, to, uh, to predict um, riskiness or, or, or crisis. What I am trying to argue is that the, uh, the assessment of risk should be uh, aligned with the business model chosen because you cannot use the same assessment tool uh, to assess the, uh, the business model of a local cooperative which is very much ingrained into, into the local SME and, and, and household finance with a, with, a, with, with a bank which has got a major trading book um, and has got, uh, is, is providing hedging tools to large multinational corporates. They are two different business models. Uh, when, you, when you assess them, both can fail, but the assessment should be tailored to the, to the respective business model. That's the, that's the point I was trying to make, which, again, is, I think is possible, is, is, is perfectly possible. Well, but, but isn't it true that... Uh, sort of those banks that, that were kind of boring, that offered boring banking, were kind of safer than others. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily want to name institutions uh, in, 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 a, in a conference, but we did see some very boring um, banks, especially in real estate finance, um, who did nothing, let's say, of the sexy investment banking um, business, uh, which we consider highly risky. And I'm not trying to, uh, to defend investment banking in, in that sense. And they, they, they failed very badly, uh, I think. Uh, so I'm not, I'm, not, um, I'm not convinced that business model itself is, 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 is explaining um, riskiness or, or probability of, of failure. We, we, we did see, um, again, I wouldn't want to name banks, but I, I've got a few on the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I could, but... Uh. but on a more, more yeah, theoretical level, then, if a bank fails, which is concentrated on the real economy, on SME lending and private um, household lending, the, the consequences for the whole system will be much smaller than a bank will fail, which is international connected. On that one, I agree. The interconnectedness of a small uh, local bank doing only, let's say, I wouldn't call it boring because it's very interesting, but, but very <laughs> important core commercial banking activities, that is true that the inter interconnectedness of that bank will be, uh, so the systemic impact of a failure will be much smaller. Uh, on that one, I would probably, probably agree. If you compare that bank to a large cross-border bank which is, uh, which is actually uh, providing derivative services for risk management, even if it's connected closely to the real economy by hedging tools, but the interconnectedness of those institutions uh, are much higher.
So on, on, on that, I agree that resolvability or the systemic impact of those large institutions is, is, is bigger. But I think that is also reflected in the, in the regulation with the, with the, with the buffer, uh, which is created for the purpose of, re of, of asking or requiring these banks to hold more capital because of their systemic importance. So that's also it, that's factored into into the regulation. So yeah, but here the capital markets uh, don't buy it, because the spread for the larger banks uh, actually a bit smaller than for the somewhat smaller banks. Do you think there's still something like uh, too big to fail in yes, these spreads? Yes, or too interconnected to fail, enabled in that way. So maybe here, uh, stim still the financial markets or the capital markets believes that um, these larger banks will be helped uh, yeah, I, earlier I, than the other banks. I think on, on, on this one, I think I, I would make two points. One is that, yes, the, the capital markets are still probably trying to find a new equilibrium prices of, of credit, and I would make um, two observations. One is that I mentioned before that the, the major ob obstacle of the new resolution mechanism is, is to establish this credibility that even large, uh, systemically important banks can fail and can, order, can be orderly resolved. If, if, that, if that credibility is established, I think pricing will, will move. The other point I would like to make is if you listen to rating agency presentations or we read uh, rating agency uh, publications, they are still um, they are still explicitly mentioning, they are not even hiding it, they are explicitly mentioning where they are factoring in implicit um, systemic or state support to the, uh, to the rating of, of unsecured creditors of, of certain banks. And very recently they started actually to downgrade some banks and quite a few banks, um, especially the outlook of, the, of, the, of their ratings, because they believe that this systemic support or this, this fiscal support is, is fading away from, uh, from these banks. So I think the capital markets have started the adjustment process, uh, but this credibility is yet to be established. That's, uh, that's my, my two observations. I want to add uh, another point here. If I've taken notes correctly during your presentation, Madame Nui, um, your view was that there is uh, possibly too many national options in banking supervision. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> you quite rightly pointed to this point, and this will be a, a major uh, obstacle to really developing rather quickly a single European approach. This is one obstacle. I see another, which is at least as important, maybe even, even bigger. That is the fact that we talk about the European single supervisory mechanism, but in fact we, we should be talking about the Eurozone supervisory mission. And we do have a split between the Eurozone and the rest. And the way I see it, the willingness of the non-Eurozone members to, on a voluntary basis, join the SSM is kind of uh, limited for the time being, given the fact that the highest decision-making body is and will remain the governing council, where these voluntary members cannot become members. And uh, that, of course, to me, is a major obstacle. The fact that the UK, and even if they could become members, the UK has made it quite clear they will never, ever join the SSM. And as long as the UK stays out, we cannot talk about a single supervisory system of the EU, it, it, it is of the Eurozone. Uh, I have the impression that Stefan Bielmeier would rather say there is too little uh, <laughs> national options. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that, that's not my, my thing about this. I think um, that uh, an harmonized European regulation party, SSM, and the, the resolution mechanism itself, it's a very important step for Europe. And if we when we can, or if we can reduce the national options within the, these bodies, these mechanisms, then the credibility will, uh, will rise very fastly. And this would be a very yeah, positive development. Unfortunately, I don't believe this. But it, in an uh, ideal world, it should be the case that the national options should be reduced to a minimum. Um, I want to touch to the last point that was somewhat um, um, used in, in last night's uh, dinner speech um, by Mr. Fitchin. Um, corporate culture. Mm -hmm. 
How should banks behave in the future? How should bankers behave in the future? Well, I mean, they, they should really do what they preach they, they, they are doing, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, i.e., they should really consider themselves to be serving the economy. And I'm not saying the real economy, because also, also, all, all parts of the economy. That should be their prime focus. And uh, if, if they did this, then that, that would be a major step forward, because in the past, we all recall, they served primarily the shareholders. Now they, they are no longer that attractive to their shareholders, so they, they shift. Uh, but I think they are needed. Banks are needed as as bloodstream for the overall economy, and therefore uh, we all have to have an interest that they are or become again successful. Now, uh, I think uh, they, they have to prove that they are honest in what they uh, promise. And there I do have occasionally my doubts. When I think, uh, when I see what is being paid again as, as bonuses in the city, etc., I do not see that there is a major cultural shift. Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, they should have accepted voluntarily, because I'm, by the way, I'm against that politicians, including the, the European Parliament, come forward with recommendations as to how the remuneration policies should be de defined. That's not our job, I think, even though we did it in, in, in the CID4. No, but I think they should have come forward with, on their own with a, with a clear message, this is how we change our practices, this is how we remunerate our, our people in the future, and this is what, how, these are the steps that we want to to go, and these are the measures that we want to implement so that in five years' time, because it does take some time, in five years' time, we will have a new culture. And that's what I'm missing. You may add something if you want to. I, I, would, I would just add one, one point. I think that, that there is, um, in, 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 this, in, in this category of risk, which, which we now uh, try to summarize as conduct risk, which is in the form of fines and redress payments to, uh, to clients, it, is, it has become so large for, uh, for some of the banks that it, be, it has become a prudential concern. It is, it is, it is, a signi it is causing significant um, uh, deterioration of, of capital ratios or capital positions, so it is becoming a concern of even shareholders in that, in, 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 in that sense. And I think um, I think the the uh, the attention paid to uh, to the general conduct, uh, the uh, remuneration of, of of staff, the remuneration of risk takers, the remuneration of, of senior management, the internal culture, the internal lines of defense that are built in in institutions, uh, have moved to a central stage um, in within within banks. And I think the uh, the, the, the speech of uh, of Mr. Fitchin last night w was giving very encouraging and, and positive signals in that in that respect. So I think uh, there is a, th there is a shift that there is a, there is a movement. Um, of course, uh, whether one wants to assess how far it has gone and is it, it is satisfactory or not, th th there might be differences of views, but, but the, the direction of travel is, I think, is, is clear. Let me add one thing. In politics, you know that we do have what we call political responsibility. Somebody, member of government, has to assume res political responsibility for major mistakes that have been made in his area of responsibility. That I'm missing in banking. Uh, what should I say, coming from a sector which is relatively boring in this respect? Okay, so let me wind up with um, an exercise of completing sentences. I have a different one for each of you, and this is also intended to <laughs> provide uh, some food for thought for the break afterwards. Um, let's start with uh, Stefan Bielmeier. In creating the European Banking Union, the costs incurred by banks uh, will be relatively high, but hopefully not so high that uh, working business mo models will be destroyed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Adam Fakers, the statement, banks are national in life, but European in death, um, should be changing under the new um, European architecture for bank resolution. Wolf Klins, the most important achievement of, of the European Banking Union will be, hopefully, a common European culture of supervision. 
Thank you. Thank you to all my panelists for a lively discussion. I can tell you that personally, there is a free lunch outside. As we know, as economists, there is no free lunch. Uh, and that uh, refers to, to some social costs. Uh, and we're grateful to the sponsors in that respect, I think. Uh, but you're still encouraged to socialize uh, during this uh, intermission. And I think we'll meet back here at 1.45. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. <laughs>